The Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Chanticleer columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is senior Chanticleer columnist at the AFR, Tony Boyd. Tony, how are you? I'm really well, James, and nice to talk to you again. Fantastic. Well, this week we're going to look at the mess at AGL Energy. We can try and figure out if the company can find a way out of its uh, current predicament. We'll look at what the Fed rate rise means for the global economy, and we'll look forward to why next Friday is a very big day for our banks. But first, Tony, I wanted to ask you about a, a hot new float on global markets, which comes from the, the hottest car brand on the planet. And that's, of course, Porsche, which is going to look at listing on the stock exchange in the coming months. You had a bit of a look at this float this week. And while Porsche is, of course, a, a car brand born in Germany, in some ways, this, this IPO, this float has been made possible by China. That's right, uh, James. The prospectus for the Porsche float was released this week and 32% of all their sales are out of China. And uh, that tells you how many rich people there are there because if you go through the prospectus, you'll find that they make about 150000 Australian dollars on each car. It's it's quite a staggering number. Wow. <laughs> but uh, some of the more interesting facts to come out of today's revelations, or I suppose this week's revelations on Porsche were that 57% of all their sales are SUVs, the wow. Cayenne and the Macan, which, um, you know, they really didn't exist uh, yeah. about seven years ago. So they've, they've actually transformed the company. And it makes you uh, realise why, you know, if you are considering a Porsche, James, it's probably going to be an SUV. <laughs> That's right. Do, do you think the um, – I mean, the, as you say, the SUV is probably, I don't know, probably 20 years old now for Porsche – but that's a staggering percentage of cars. Do you think that's because it makes it easier for the, the car owner and the family to sort of justify it? You know, I'm not buying a sports car, I'm buying a family car? Yeah, well, when you think about it, a McCann is about 90000 Australian dollars. Um, right. A good electric vehicle is not much less than that. And um, one of the interesting stats Porsche put out this week was that 60% of all the buyers of Porsches since 2019 had never bought one before. So I think you're right. I think right. there's families uh, sort of telling themselves, you know, we can seat uh, all of the kids in the back. It, it ticks all the boxes for a family car, but okay, it's a Porsche. <laughs> well, the, the other thing about this, Tony, is, you know, it, it's cool to have one of those big, another big brand on the uh on, on a listed stock exchange. I mean, people love investing in names they know, Apple and Nike and Costco and Target and those sort of things. But it, it's worth noting that this isn't just a big deal for the, the car industry. It's a big deal for capital markets. It's a big deal for investment bankers because we haven't seen many floats this year and and this is going to be the the, the really big uh, deal of the year in, in, in terms of the IPO market. Yeah, well, it's fascinating that Deutsche, the biggest bank in Germany and one that the government really re really wants to support, is nowhere near this. Right. The uh, global lead managers are Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, JP Morgan and Citi. So uh, I think VW, which owns Porsche, has, has been very pragmatic and uh, commercially orientated. And uh, the amazing thing is that if you take the midpoint of the pricing on this, mm. it's worth about 88 billion euros. I mean, it is a big deal for capital marks in wow. markets in Europe. Um, and, of course, that's the equivalent of what VW today, which owns Audi, Skoda and Seat, is worth. So th this is a really uh, smart deal by the VW um, management. Yeah, absolutely. Is this one that Australian investors are going to be able to take a look at and potentially buy shares in, or is it a little bit more complicated than that? Well, most Australians get their international exposure through super funds. Yep. And of course, Australian super funds, are, they're, they're trying to allocate $100 billion a year just in inflows. I'd say there'll be a lot of Australians ending up owning a little bit of Porsche, even if they can't drive one. Right, right. Well, Tony, I'm sure there's a few Porsches, perhaps a few Porsche SUVs, more to the point, heading down the highway from Sydney to Melbourne this weekend for the uh, grand final, the AFL grand final. Unfortunately, my team, the uh, Collingwood Magpies, were beaten last week, but we've got Geelong, the, the, the Cats playing Sydney Swans, and there's a bit of a, 
a, a business story here. I mean, the the president of the Geelong Football Club is a guy called Craig Drummond, who used to be the CEO of Medibank and an executive at National Australia Bank. And then on the other side of the fence, for the, the, the Sydney Swans president is a guy called Andrew Pridham, who's a longtime investment banker and is the uh, vice chairman of MA Financial, which is the old Molus Australia. Um, Tony, the, the, these are... It, we we always see business people getting involved in sport, and it, it, it's it's always part of a you know part passion play, I guess. But when you get to the big game, it's, it's serious business for these teams. I mean, it's going to be a serious windfall for whoever uh, takes the premiership on Saturday afternoon. Yes, and uh, the the wonderful contrast I thought this week in sport was that the Australian Soccer Federation was really pleased to get a ten million dollar deal uh, with Subway. Um, about two weeks after the AFL signed a $4.5 billion deal <laughs> for its uh, broadcast rights. So, yeah, there's there's a real uh, separation happening in uh, on the money side of Australian sport. I mean, with the AFL having that much money to spend, it's very hard to see how the NRL, uh, the uh, rugby union or soccer can, can possibly compete in the years ahead. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, traditionally, the sort of rule of thumb has been that if you can win the premiership in the AFL, that's sort of around going to double your profits for the year because you'll sell merchandise and DVDs and T-shirts and all sorts of memorabilia that the fans will lap up. Um, Tony, uh, uh, I imagine being a Sydney sider, you're a Swan supporter. Uh, Have you got a tip in the game for us? Yeah, look, I, I really do think the Swans can win it. I hope they do a better job than last week where they just sort of held on by their fingernails right at the <laughs> end. Uh, but, yeah, look, the, the Swans have, have become a real phenomenon in Sydney and they cut across all socioeconomic groups. It's not like uh, rugby's more for people who sent their kids to private schools and um, I think the Swans have actually got a, a, a wonderful groundswell of support from, from just about everyone in Sydney. Yeah, well, the Cats are a, Geelong is obviously a, a, a town about an hour out of Melbourne, real working class town. You know, home previously home to the Ford factory and lots of heavy industry, but it's changed in the last little while, and now it's a uh, you know a very different place. But they'll be cheering loudly. I think the Cats win. I think they win quite easily. So let's see how we're looking on Saturday afternoon, Tony. But look, we better get into the serious business now and. Um, You've been covering this this week. Uh, poor old AGL Energy has been through a year of drama. Um, th- this is the big energy company based in Sydney, uh, over, over 180 years old. In, Mar- in May, it, it received a takeover approach from the software billionaire Mike Cannon-Brooks. Now, that deal did eventually fall over, but Cannon-Brooks then successfully led a campaign to block AGL's plan to split into two companies. There was a good AGL, which is the retail business, and a bad AGL, which was uh, the fossil fuel power generation business. Tony, uh, the, 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 there's, since that uh, demerger, that, that split in two, fell over, the company's been reeling. What, what happened there this week? Well, a new chairman uh, was appointed, Patricia McKenzie, and she replaced uh, Peter Botton, who, you know, very long experienced person in uh, business. But of course, Mike Cannon Brooks came out straight away and said he had reservations about her effectively appointing herself uh, mm-hmm. without uh, putting in the person that he wanted. Now, the, the, the difficulty with that type of narrative is that we really don't know who he wants apart from. Uh, there was a very good piece by Joe Aston in Rear Window, which which put up a lot of candidates, um, one of whom, Paula Dwyer, uh, withdrew without getting there. But the resignation of Graham Hunt, who was the chief executive, previously on the board and stepped in to replace Brett Redman, who left uh, very suddenly and un- under unusual circumstances. Diane Smith-Gander also left. I mean, uh, Miles George, someone who used to run Infogen, a, a windmill company, is uh, now going to join the board. I mean, there is just total chaos here, and I think it must be affecting morale within the company. Um, Cannon Brooks, of course, is worth $21 billion. He could buy this entire company uh, <laughs> with, with one-fifth of his, his assets, but he's not showing any signs of actually giving any direction to the market about what he thinks. I mean, do you think Cannon Brooks is uh, providing a positive catalyst for change there? 
Well, I don't think so. So, so he still owns eleven percent, um, and in a company without with with relatively few large shareholders, that puts him in a powerful position. But we don't really know what he wants to do with that power. Like we've got this general idea that he wants AGL to to go green sooner and close its fossil fuel power states, coal fired power stations as soon as possible, and generally you know, lean into the energy transition. But there's not a lot of details as to what that looks like. So what you've got is, you know, Cannon Brooks sort of playing the role of Dr. No. The AGL puts up an idea, or whether it's a, a new executive or a new board member, and Cannon Brooks sort of says, no, nah, I don't think so. I don't really like that. But as you say, we, we don't have a great idea of what he does like. Um, so it, it leaves the company in this really difficult position. I mean, Tony, they've got a strategic review to be released next week. Um, what, what do you think that's going to say? And, and will Cannon Brooks again, you know, b- play Dr. No and say, oh, I don't know about that? Yes, it's it's going to be fascinating to see what's in that strategic review because once they can the separation of the, of the, the so-called good clean energy company from the dirty energy company, they uh, left themselves in a big ditch. Now, it cost $160 million to get into that ditch, but they can't really reverse out of it very quickly. Um, no. I mean, and there's big uh, political and community questions over this company's future, uh, in particular the Latrobe Valley. I mean, they have to come up with some solutions for basically restructuring and retraining an entire workforce that makes that uh, part of Australia uh, survive as an economic entity. So... Um, Hopefully, Cannon Brooks is going to come out and give us his take with his plan soon yeah. after uh, uh, the strategic review. But as it looks at the moment, um, I think the company's uh, in a really bad way and it's hard to see them uh, rescuing themselves without uh, perhaps being taken private. I mean, what's yeah, your yeah. opinion? Yeah, look, my only caveat my only, the only sort of light at the end of the tunnel I see is that they get a good CEO. Like it is, it is quite amazing how much a CEO who can sort of unite the tribes, someone who's, you know, wins over Cannon Brooks, who can win over the markets and win over investors. If you just had that focal point, then maybe things can start to happen. That they could start to get this, you know, find a compromise position. And 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 start to actually put some plans in place. So I think that's that's the hope. But you, you're right. Until you can get Cannon Brooks on side, um, it's going to be really difficult. And you know, in a way, I think your point's right. He, he does need to show us what he what, what what his plan is and what the detail is around that. It, it's very easy to sort of sit there saying, "Oh no, I don't like that person. No, don't like that person. Don't like that person." And and no doubt behind the scenes he's trying to find the right person. But, um, you know, we, 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 I think investors and, and the community more broadly need to have a bit of a better sense of where, what's the end game here. Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, someone reminded me this week, it's, uh, it's not who you fire that changes a company, it's who you hire. Yeah. And, and I think you're right. The most important decision this company makes is who is going to run it. And obviously, it has to be someone that Mike Cannon Brooks agrees with. Otherwise, we're just going to have this continued dysfunctional chaos, uh, which is not good for anybody. No, that's right. That's right. Well, Tony, the other big news of the week was the Federal Reserve, which is the US equivalent of the RBA, raising rates by three quarters of a percent or 0.75 percent, which has taken uh, the US official cash rate to between 3 percent and 3.25 percent. And then basically the message from Jerome Powell, who's the chair of the Federal Reserve, was was that he's got to fight, focus on this fight against inflation and, and there's no stopping. He's acknowledged this week that that might involve a quite major economic slowdown. Um, he, he's using the R word, recession even. Um, he still thinks it's possible to dodge that, but... Tony, the, the equity markets, share markets thought that the Fed would eventually back away from this aggressive tightening cycle, these aggressive rate rises, but it's just not happening, is it? I mean, ha- have markets read this wrong? Yes, I think they have read it wrong, uh, James, and I'm, I'm intrigued with the way in which monetary policy around the world is being practised at the moment when you think that 
the um, conventional uh, approach was put up rates uh, often very sharply mm. and then wait to see how consumers respond. Um, what's going on in America at the moment is let's just keep putting them up and up and up. And we're, by the way, we've got this target for the end of the year of four and a half yep. and nothing's going to stop us getting to that because we are determined to kill inflation. And then, of course, the question is now, how, how deep will the recession be in America? Because they're determined to cause it. Uh, they're not waiting around to see what reaction there is to, to the last rate cut. They're ready to whack on another one. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the gap here is quite, still quite large. I mean, inflation is running at about 8%. Um, and if you take out gasoline and food, it's still running at about 6%. The Fed wants to get down to 2%, so that is still a huge gap. That's a big gap to close. And I think, Tony, it's also worth noting this really does matter for the global economy. You know, why we get so focused on the Fed is because what they do with interest rates affects everyone around the world. Last night, um, we saw Switzerland, Indonesia, the Philippines, Norway, and the Bank of England all raise rates as well because they're facing similar challenges. Inflation's got away from them. And they're all having to uh, sort of keep up with the Joneses and, and they don't want their economy to get out of step with the rest of us, uh, of the world. D- do you think Phil Lowe at the RBA um, is, is thinking the same? It, will the Fed's move have some influence on what the RBA does? Yes, I think it will. Um, they will have to follow, uh, if not like the Japanese, to keep the currency um, at some level that they think is appropriate. Of course, the Japanese haven't moved at all, and that's why the yen is now, I think, uh, at the lowest it's been for 20 years. But, um, yeah, I look, the next move by the RBA, I think there's um, a chance it'll be 25. I mean, there's also a chance it could be 50. But uh, I think we are different from America uh, in that uh, we have such a strong uh, unemployment. Uh, we're going to bring back immigration um, we're a capital exporter now. We don't have a current account deficit. Um, the, the Americans have got a massive debt problem. There's all sorts of uh, issues that they have that we don't. So um, would <laughs> I, I, I suppose there's a 50-50 chance we'll have a recession as well, but uh, it's probably not going to be as, as severe as the one in America. You sound like you're, you, you're a bit optimistic there, Tony, that maybe we can have the soft landing in Australia. Yes. What What do you think? I'm I'm getting more and more worried. What What's worrying me is the situation in America with the employment market. But really, what Powell needs to do, and he's sort of saying the quiet part out loud, is that he needs to create unemployment and, and a fair bit of it to start cooling the economy down. Um. So the 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 U.S. unemployment rate at the moment is three point seven percent. The economists are now thinking he needs to get that to four and a half to five percent, which is the equivalent of about two million jobs. That that's a lot of pain in an economy. Now Australia's unemployment rate again is is around that three point four, three point five percent. So I just wonder, is is the RBA starting to think similarly? Are, are they starting to think, well, we need to cause a bit of pain too, and that pain is going to show up in the jobs market. Um so I just worry that our employment market, like in the US, is so hot that there's a there's a fair bit of pain coming. And it might play out over a couple of years and perhaps, you know, it's not a sharp recession that really hurts. Maybe it's a slower, um, slower but deeper um, slowdown. So, yeah, I, I'm getting a bit worried, Tony, that this inflation genie is out of the bottle and central banks around the world are going to find it really hard to get it back in there without causing pain. So hopefully I'm wrong. <laughs> yes, I hope you're wrong too. <laughs> right, Tony, well, we're going to take a break now, but um, we are going to come back with a fascinating week for the Australian economy and particularly our big banks. Welcome back, Tony and and listeners. We've got a fascinating week for the Australian economy coming up. Um, The the first two big events of the week are connected. Uh, On Wednesday, we get official retail sales figures. And on Thursday, we get the results from a company called Premier Investments, which is 
uh, run by Solomon Liu, perhaps uh, Australia's most famous retailer, and a guy called Richard Murray, who used to be the CEO at JB Hi-Fi and moved across to run Premier a couple of years ago. Tony, one of the interesting things about what we're seeing in the economy is while rates are going up, consumer spending hasn't started to come off a lot at all. And and so this these two retail sales and then Premier's results should give us a bit of an insight into the mind of the shoppers out there. Yes, I think you're right. I think um, various speeches by people uh, from the RBA have, uh, I suppose, given us an indication that they're going to be closely watching all leading and lagging economic indicators to see how the, the economy is travelling in the wake of all the rate rises. Um, and as you probably know with the mortgage, as I do, that uh, they've gone up very sharply. Yeah. And it is strange that it hasn't actually affected people's consumption habits. And, of course, the only explanation that can be given for that is that the $20 billion in savings that we built up during COVID, we're starting to dig into that and that all of that money that sits in those mortgage offset accounts, which I suppose is there for a rainy day, is is starting to be used. That's my only explanation for it. Uh- I think you're right. It's it's raining and people are starting to uh, to spend a bit. It, it will be interesting with Premier. I mean, Solomon Liu, Richard Murray, it's the dynamic duo of Australian retail. There's probably not two better retailers working for the same company in this country. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how they they are feeling. Um, that they're in, you know, they own Premier owns brands like Just Jeans and JJ's and uh, Portman's, and then they've also got Smiggle and a big stake in Breville, which is the uh, appliance manufacturer. So they, they cover an awful lot of the consumer economy. So it's going to be really interesting to see if they're starting to get worried or still seeing things hold up okay. Um, yes, well, look, I, I made my contribution to the result uh, with a new Breville coffee machine uh, oh, good. a couple yeah. of months ago, James, a, a very high-quality product. Now, I mean, we're not here to do endorsements, but <laughs> I, I think um, your experience of a company is often a reason to buy it. But the other fascinating thing about Solomon Lewis is strategy against Meyer, exactly yeah, the yeah. same as Cannon Brooks. I'm not going to tell you how to run this company. I'm just going to tell you you've got a – I don't know. I'm not sure. I think he's – what's he trying to say? Well, he, he he's – you're exactly right. He's very similar to Cannon Brooks. He, 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 he's not going to tell you what he does like, but he'll tell you what he doesn't like. And Maya has been in this holding pattern um, for <laughs> really five years and not not going sideways rather than up or down. That could be the fate that that awaits AGL too, with Mike Cannon Brook sitting on the register with a big chunk. So, yeah, that's another question to ask Solly. What's 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 the go at Maya? But um, the the other thing, Tony, is uh, September thirty looms next Friday. Now, this is a big date for the banks. What what what? Why is it that? Why why is this important? Well, of course, this is when they rule off their books for their full financial year, and uh, I don't I don't know what the historical. Uh, sort of trigger was, but the banks uh, and their auditors are able to work in a much less uh, intensive period to to the June 30 uh, end of financial year. And um, I checked some analyst forecasts, I think about $17 billion of cash profits are expected from the big three that sign off in September. That's about $6 billion from ANZ, $7 billion from NAB, and about $5 billion from Westpac. Um, it's it's been a good period for the banks largely because they've been lagging on uh, paying the deposit rates while they've been cranking up the uh, home loan mortgage rates a lot faster and that's there's this sort of uh, window of opportunity for them to really expand their profit margins but you mentioned earlier the RBA's desire to get unemployment up that is the biggest leading indicator of problems in loan books do you think the good times are going to last the, the next year is going to be really interesting the, the, because the banks will have a tailwind from rising interest rates, uh, as you just said, but then they'll be looking forward to the spectre of increasing unemployment. Home loans go bad for three reasons. A person loses their job, they get sick, or they have a change in family circumstances like a divorce or something like that. And so when you've got uh, unemployment rising, that's when the banks will start to get nervous. And I think you've already seen in the last six months or so, investors starting to just get a little bit more worried about the banks. And, uh, you know, I, I think there'll be plenty of questions when they present their results a little 
in, in a couple of months about where they see the outlook for unemployment and the broader economy. Well, Tony, uh, we we want to make our podcast as interactive as possible, and uh, we'd love you to send in your questions to Chanticleer at AFR.com. And our first question comes from Katie. Thanks for listening, Katie. And she's got a ripper, which is, uh, what will a third La Nina weather event mean for her insurance premiums and for the economy more generally? Tony, you've written a bit about this, uh, a La, La Nina weather pattern, which means more rain than... Uh, than is usual. We've had one for the last two years. You live in Sydney where you've copped plenty of that. It's not good news for our insurance premiums, is it? No, it's definitely not, James. And you may have heard that over the past 24 hours, 150 millimetres of rain fell in the Northern Rivers region of New South Mm. Wales. And so basically there could actually be another flood at Lismore, which would be the third one this year. So what... Uh, can happen is that as the premiums go up, there's less activity uh, in terms of claims and insurance companies, the two big ones, IAG and Suncorp, enjoy uh, unusually higher profits. But if you're going into the third year of a La Nina, then um, I don't think they're going to get that benefit of that higher profitability from no activity occurring. I mean, uh, a good example was about uh, five or six years ago, there was a cyclone, all the premiums went up, and then there was no other big perils for a couple of years, and, and the two big companies made a lot of uh, unusually high profits. So, But for Katie as an individual, I think um, just you've just got to shop around. I mean, there's, there's nothing you can do about uh, an oligopoly raising premiums at the same time. Um, this is not cartel behaviour, mind you, James. It's just they both seem to do it at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair to them, they're encountering more risks, aren't they? And and these big weather events are becoming a lot more expensive. I mean, for the broader economy, though, Tony, the, 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 this sort of repeated flooding and, and, you know, previously we've seen re- repeated fire events it's a it's a drag on economic growth, isn't it? I mean, it just shows that we're paying a cost for climate change in terms of economic growth and uh, you know sustainability of of the economy already. You know, we're, we're already in that position. It's it's not something that's you know coming in twenty fifty. Yes, and I think you're right. If unless unless there's increased government investment in mitigation, we're going to end up with uh, the government having to underwrite. Uh, the insurance premiums of high-risk areas. We certainly know from studies done by Suncorp that too many houses have been built in flood-prone areas and should never have been approved. Now, there's a couple of solutions. You either knock them down or you put them up on stilts. But if you go to the last Lismore flood, it's 17 metres. I can't see a house being cranked up that high. There's just certain places that become unlivable, which which is terrible and shocking for families that grew up in certain areas uh, around like Lismore. Yeah, yeah, but we're clearly at the point where we need some dramatic solutions to dramatic problems. So it's it's one, hopefully, uh, governments are going to continue to push hard on because the insurers, to, in fa- again, in fairness to them, th- they are desperate for more flood mitigation efforts and, and have been campaigning on that for a very long time. Well, Tony, thank you so much for uh, another great episode. Uh, good luck with your swans this weekend, Barricard. Yes, thank you, James. Enjoy. the, the uh, that, That's amazing out at the MCG. I've been to two grand finals. Uh, unfortunately, um, both of them were walkovers, so it got a bit sort of uh, <laughs> boring in the third quarter. But uh, let's hope it's a nice, close game. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson, and Tony Boyd. This podcast was produced and edited by Lap Fan. Technical production was by Cormac Lally. If you like our podcast and you want to hear more, consider rating and reviewing us as it helps others find us. And follow us on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. You can subscribe to The Financial Review, The Daily Habit of Successful People, at afr.com slash subscribe. The Australian Financial Review.